Biomedical Center, very in another campus in the Complutense University, but they are relatively close to here. So Flora is a, a scientist or a very prestigious uh, scientist in the in retinal development in uh, proinsulin, so the action of proinsulin. So has a very innovative research on the action of proinsulin in the retina as a potential target or treatment for uh, degenerative disease in the retina, among others, as a scientific point of view. So there is uh, much, much, much more that I could say. But she's here today for another <coughs> of her uh, commitments in, in her uh, career. So it's just woman in science. So she just was founder of the AMI, which is an association of uh, researcher and technological women, so since 2001. So she is very active in uh, uh, highlighting the, the, the role of women in science, and she also um, has been uh, invited to, to, to give uh, the, 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 this topic in, in a lot of audiences, and it's, well, she is just uh, really, really the right person to, to give this. this lecture or this uh, talk today. So um, she's a very, very busy woman, so I acknowledge that she has taken a, a bit of time to come here. So thank you very much. Thank you, Angela, um, Paloma, and all the other organizers of uh, this meeting. And it's really a pleasure to be here to talk about my second commitment. As Angela said, my first commitment is still the practice of science, but my really second commitment since the last 20 years has been to try to promote the uh, role uh, of women in science, which has many uh, axes. Uh, axes. Uh, really, uh, there is a problem in fixing the numbers of all women in science. There's a second problem in fixing the institutions, make all the institutions aware of why this is important for the excellence of science. And there is a third axis, uh, which is the content of science that has to have a gender um, uh, perspective to be really good science. I cannot cover all these three important uh, uh, targets, which is to increase all those things and improve all those things. But I will just give a little, uh, hopefully, clarifying and updated uh, points of view so that each of you can go back to different uh, aspects and maybe learn a little bit more about yourself. The fair facts are really well uh, clear for all of you in this audience. Every cellular human is sex. Every person is gender. So gender is not the same as sex. Gender is acquired by, any, uh, by every person after birth due to the environmental, cultural, social influences on the person which has either a male sex, is an XY, uh, karyotype or female XX and uh, there is a small percentage of intersexual individuals that have a different karyotype but that's a small percentage then a very different thing happens with gender gender is a large diversity a spectrum of <coughs> uh, characters uh, if you, you're going from 1 to 10 perhaps in the right middle a uh, so-called stereotypical male maybe no more than 30%, a stereotypical female, no more than 30%. And then uh, there are streams of people with all different uh, uh, chromosomal um, uh, features that do have an, uh, a gender expectation, a gender behavior, a gender uh, everything. <coughs> so nowadays, from the most extreme, uh, you can go to the queer fluid uh, spectrum where people apparently, I don't understand very well how, but these people, they say that they feel even a few days or a few weeks or a few years, one gender and the next years, weeks, months, another gender. So it's a complex issue that has to have a lot of, uh, that has a lot of uh, things to do with brain and uh, that cannot, I cannot cover <laughs> that today, but uh, just to make clear that uh, this is an issue today that we need to understand better. Sex and gender, of course, matter. There is no question about that. They are major determinants of our life. And since we get up every day, all of us in the room, and go to work, 
of course, they are uh, major determinants of our work life. So we have to face that. And in science, in particular uh, biomedical science, is better taking into consideration sex and gender as much as taking into consideration uh, things such as race, income, country. When I compare sex issues or gender issues with uh, uh, racial issues, people look at me, oh, there are different things. No, they are the same. You are in the world with some features, and those features impact on how you are perceived, and those features impact how you work, how you relate to other people. So don't forget that science is part of our society, and therefore all <coughs> people working in science do have all this backpack to go uh, with it uh, throughout our uh, work life. There are many uh, studies in the United States and uh, European community since the 90s to integrate gender perspective into research. And this is not only an obligation, since the social impact of research is on men and women, and that's the thing, but also because it makes um, science more innovative and less flawed. So keep in mind that my point of view is that a science content that has not gender perspective is, by definition, a flawed science. That is, is not perfect. It's much more perfect if you keep in mind that every aspect including all diseases in medicine, not only the uh, reproductive diseases, but all of medicine aspects, including the cataracts, for instance, because women are less uh, often operated of cataracts than men, believe it or not, nowadays in the 19, in the 2000 and uh, whatever year we are, 18. Uh, <laughs> so it's hard to believe these features that uh, they are real. Going back to 1994, I was at that time in the National Institute of Health in Bethesda in the United States. The president of the NIH, uh, the general director, was Dr. Bernard Ryan She uh, was a cardiologist. And thanks God, she realized that clinical trials are not per were not performed in the right way. So she made it clear that the pharmacokinetics are supposed to most type of treatments are different in men and women, and therefore the clinical trials had to be performed in both sexes. So she could implement that because she was the director of, uh, general director of NIH. And, and it had an impact because even now it's not perfect, not all clinical trials are performed in the same percentage in men and women, but at least there was a, a, an advance in that problem. 20 years later, in 2014, uh, the associate director of the Women Health Research Program that was implemented uh, thanks to the initiative of uh, successive uh, directors of NIH starting in Chile, uh, she said what we pursue with this program, Women Health Research Program, is to transform how people think about science and that does transform how science is made. When you put the gender perspective into all aspects of science, then you start looking at things in a different way, and therefore finding different things, because finding is the purpose of research, and they are in, in biomedical sciences, at the end, having an impact on how diseases are treated. But luckily for the Americans, when they put a program, uh, they put money over the table. Uh, that's not the case always in Europe, and less so in Spain. And at that time, in 2014, the New York, New York Times recapitulated this um, headline, health researchers will get 10 million, a little bit over 10 million, to counter gender bias in studies. In an effort to be in addressing persistent gender bias in laboratory research, the NIH announced Tuesday that it will distribute 10.1 million in grants <laughs> to more than 80 scientists studying a diverse array of subjects, including drug addiction, fetal development, migraines, and stroke. The researchers will use the additional funds to include more human participants, generally women, in clinical trials, and to ensure that they lab their laboratory animals, even cell lines, are representative of both genders. The money also will be used to analyze gender differences in the resulting data, Officer said. That is, the full program was reinforced uh, after uh, this decision of NIH of putting money over the data. And uh, this is important, as I said, for all diseases. If we have five minutes for questions, 
at the end, uh, I'll be happy to answer specific questions because now I have to move to the other issue. More women in science. And I'll have a look at Europe. If you look at Europe, those numbers here represent the number of, the average number of women in science in each country. And you uh, are probably surprised to see, let's see if I can get the one there, that the northern countries do not have even 40%, uh, 38, 36, and the Mediterranean countries are exactly in the same average numbers. So that is good news because in many aspects we always look at the northern countries to see how progress is made. Uh, the thing is that if you then look at the uh, eastern countries, uh, then there are even countries with more than 40%, even several with 50% women in science. And you say, why is that? But the key is not to look here. The key is look here. Germany, Switzerland, uh, Austria, they have less than 30%, 25%, 28%. So the interpretation of this data is that in rich countries where science is a very prestigious job, particularly in biomedical sciences, head doctor, professor, earns three times what I earn. Uh, I don't know if there are German people in the audience, but uh, <laughs> uh, that is the situation. Uh, women uh, are less ac have less access to the top level because it's a higher level of uh, mm. salaries, prestigious, uh, prestige, everything. While in these countries here, uh, in the, uh, I, I'm sorry, former uh, Easter countries, it's just the opposite. Science is really not practiced very much. Biomedical sciences uh, researchers are very poorly paid. So it has to do more with the level of uh, the importance of science in society than with the real difficulty of women going to the top. Having said that, it's still easier to get to the top in the northern countries than into the Mediterranean countries. And everywhere, the women have to face this leaky pipe of women in science. And this leaky pipe says that when uh, you count the number of people coming out of the universities, initially uh, in Spain, more women than men come out of the universities. In this moment, 60% of uh, people coming out of the universities are women. But then you lose women as drops in a leaky pipe, uh, initially and, uh, due to the lack of, of support, later uh, following motherhood, later due to lack of career expectations, and finally they feel isolated and excluded in many institutions. So it's a really leaky pipe that covers all the career path. And if you want more numbers, I only have good numbers for uh, examples from the United States, but I think in Europe, um, we are very similar. So in the academic pipeline, the leaks get after graduate school <coughs> and PhD receipt. Here, uh, women at the uh, level of having babies, at the age of having babies, 29% less likely, um, less likely than women without babies to enter the track positions. Women married, married, not children. 20% less likely than single women to enter the neutral positions. Uh, here, after uh, half career already uh, run, 23% less likely than them to become associate professors. And at the level of full professors, and then 25% less likely than men to become full professor within a maximum of 16 years. Some of uh, the women in academia get to the top level, but really very late in their uh, 60s when really they are almost out of the system and uh, that is not fair. So why that career path is more difficult for women than men? Well this is a, a picture that represents how things go. If you are going to go to a high hill, to a high mountain and uh, really climb up to the top, uh, it's very useful to have someone holding the cord for you and showing you the path. And in general, men are in a context that uh, has this situation. Someone is helping going to the top and showing the, the way, the best, the easier way to get to the top. Women are in general much more alone, uh, less people are standing up for to help them, and sometimes they don't even know that they are just not going through the easiest path. So this is still true in, uh, in uh, 
in Mediterranean countries and in Europe, and the challenges ahead for women trying to uh, have a full academic career are multiple, but a few of them I mentioned here. First of all, the height of the mountain. I, there is no question, and you all know very well, it's a difficult career. It's a very dedicated career, and not everyone has the possibility to get to the top. Sometimes not even the possibility to have a full career with uh, productivity and funding. The society support is variable. In some countries, it's definitely better than the others. The loneliness when climate, this affects more women, as I said, these two things affect both men and women. Fighting stereotypes affects more uh, women and men, and family work decisions affects more women than men. So at the uh, present time, recruit, retain, and recover, which are the three R's that we should do to improve uh, science and the scientific pool of researchers is more difficult for men and women now in Europe. So more men and women are finding difficulties in finding a science job compared to other parts of the world. Retain more difficult for men and women now in Spain, not only for women, it's really a situation where it's very hard to find jobs in Spain and science, and more difficult to recover, particularly difficult for women, and that happens everywhere. So uh, this is a, a picture of uh, EMBO, uh, which uh, several, uh, several years ago had a program, program called Set Roots. And this Set Roots sent ambassadors to our Europe to talk uh, about these issues. I was one of the uh, EMBO ambassadors in that program. And uh, they made this figure to this, this picture of this um, slide to just show that the social and professional support that men receive throughout their careers can be represented by a good chair to sit and a good laptop. And women sometimes they don't even know they are sitting right up on the air and nobody is supporting them. So it's just a, um, an icon. Um, so we have to fight the stereotypes, fight the stereotypes that are in our retinas, in our brains, and everywhere. Men generally, when they uh, there is an opening for a professorship or some role, important role model, say, why not me? I'm very clever. I'm the best. I have published a lot. Of, why not me? Women very often with exactly the same CV, they say, oh, why me? I might not be suitable for that job. So they feel much more insecure because of this lack of general support and people giving a pat on their shoulder saying, oh, of course, you are also the best. Um, so unconscious stereotypes, we really have to fight against those because both men and women have unconscious stereotypes. And I'm going to show you an article that some of you may know in which it was clear that the unconscious stereotypes uh, still exist. It was published in 2012 in the NDS, with a bad journal. Uh, and it's called the experiment of a gender CV, George or gender. So what they did was as follows. This was done by a group of uh, social researchers, psychologists and social researchers. They took 27 uh, women and men, which were PIs, principal investigators from laboratories of technical disciplines in the USA. And they sent them, first they said, we are going to uh, have a study. Would you like to participate? But they knew nothing about the study. So they received a single CV which in half of them belonged to John and the other half belonged to Jennifer for lab manager position. And we're asked to rate it. The CV was identical except on the top. In one case, said Jennifer and the other, Jennifer whatever. And in the other case, John whatever. And the PIs were senior people. Despite an identical CV, faculty participants rated the male applicant as significantly more competent and horrible and they would offer him a better salary and more career mentoring than to her, identical thing. Female and male faculty were equally likely to exhibit bias against the female applicant, who was viewed as very nice but less competent. The conclusion is that sexist stereotypes and unconscious biases still contaminate professional choice, even in the top leaders of very good reputated laboratories. So all of us have to really become conscious that we have these stereotypes. So here is um, some recommendations that were set out by this set roots uh, program uh, led by EMBO a few years back. There are two slides. 
and there are many recommendations. Some of them are really applicable to any institution and any cluster such as uh, of uh, yours. Effective means to empower men and women. Some of them are also very useful to empower men, and uh, as I said, science is a difficult job, so we better have both empower young men and empower young women. <coughs> Providing career advice and help for people who follow their patterns to a new job. That's an important tech thing that I, I'm sorry, I have no time to really discuss in depth, but uh, not every woman has to follow uh, the postdoc uh, partner because that has an impact on uh, her career. And people should think twice about this follow. I follow you, you follow me. So it should be really discussed very much in depth. Changing institutional culture, highlighting good practice, improving the working environment, and removing unconscious bias. We have just talked about it. Working towards transparent selection and promotion processes, and educating selection committees about, again, unconscious biases. Ensuring that women are fairly represented on committees, that set policy and control funds. Control funds, very important. Supporting studies that bring to light the roots of gender bias in science is not a minor issue. So people who think that this is a secondary uh, uh, thing to deal uh, with is really wrong. Continue, supporting the students at all levels and encouraging men and women into maths and science related subjects. In Spain and in Europe, I said, we have a lack of students interested in science, maths, engineering. Reaching out to students to help them plan careers, both men and women, but more women. Finding appropriate mentors for young scientists. Offering flexible working hours to men and women with families. In the uh, EMBO um, Heidelberg Institution, um, they have a very nice daycare that closes three days a year. So every man and woman working at the EMBL lab has a chance to have the baby or the child really taken care of in a very good place. We have asked to several presidents of the ethic to put uh, the care centers, at least at the big centers, and uh, obviously they always say we have no money for that. So let's talk about the ethic for five minutes. <laughs> and look at the numbers in our institution. We have 2,800 uh, staff scientists. We were over 3,000, but with the crisis, we have lost uh, over 200 people. 36% uh, are women at the moment. Uh, this is an average of all eight areas. Those of you working in the FESIC know we have eight different fields covered by the FESIC. And we have three levels, uh, entry level, investigators, and professors. FESIC in 1982, obviously we have improved in the number of study scientists in over three decades, and we have reached uh, a third of, over a third of us when we were only a quarter. It's a little improvement. I look at the numbers when I get to the press that the uh, progress is very slow. The major change was when at uh, the beginning of the 2000, women, uh, we, we started the Women and Science Commission. Uh, we had to convince the president at that time, who was a physicist, that the thesis was not neutral. He couldn't believe it. He said, it's not possible. And we showed him numbers, and you know, as an intelligent man, which is those that understand the numbers, uh, said, really, something happens here, because that cannot be pure coincidence. We are a very selected, elitistic, if you want, part of the society, and in these levels, women and men would be equally capable if there was nothing uh, you know, forbidden. So uh, the TESIC has been also a pioneer. It was the first public research organist to apply the mandate of gender balance in the selection and promotion committees in 2005. It was a consequence of the uh, information and pressure set out by the uh, Women and Science Commission, and also the help of the government at that time, who was really convinced that gender issues were infor important for all professions or careers. And uh, now <coughs> there is no less than 40% women in all selection uh, committees uh, uh, at entry level or promotion level. It has also been first public organization to establish two weeks ago an accreditation on gender equality. So for the first time, centers and institutes can apply for this uh, specific accreditation. 
uh, this year is kind of a um, test, and there's a 3,000 uh, award for the institution winning the award, but uh, you know, institutions have to look at their numbers, their policies, their scientific uh, programs, and see if they could qualify. It's already published, so those Spanish centers like this one uh, could enter the competition. I am very curious to see which one wins, not our institute, by the way. Uh, so the figure here, sorry, I haven't had the time to translate it in English or here, but uh, at least you understand the position of women and men, basic staff scientists, as of last week. Um, so if you look at what we call the scissors diagram, a lot of women are starting in the uh, undergraduate level, 56%, and then all the rest of the numbers is just going down. And uh, women professors like myself, we are only 25% of the whole set of professors. Um, so 40% at the level of the more advanced uh, postdocs, 44% uh, at the level of junior postdocs, and then entry level at the border of 40% and uh, scientists in the middle of their career, 35%. This is going to close so slow that for sure I won't see it, but not even my daughter will see it. I mean, this is really going very, very slow. Um, although it's better than the universities. I don't have the time to show you the scissors diagram for the university, but it's 21% at this, at this point. So we are a little bit better than the universities. This is a, a glass ceiling index uh, covering from the year 2000 when we started to collect the numbers. And it's calculated at uh, something called sheet figures, which publish the uh, European Union every three years. So I won't go into how to calculate it, but it's clear that we, everything above one is bad. So we aim at being right flat at the bottom in one. And we started very badly over two points of the last <coughs> in place. And those two arrows mark when the Commission of Women in Science started, as I said, in 2001, <coughs> unofficially 2002, officially. And then when the measures of the uh, government at that time um, <coughs> implemented, for instance, that aspect of having uh, no less than 40% women in the committees. So the slope here, you really see that up to 2010, it was good, we were included very quickly. What happened after the crisis, the economical crisis 2010, is that we stopped. And everything is like that. The ratio of men getting promotion over women is uh, worse for women than for men at the present time. It was perfect for five years, from 2005 to 10. In each area, the proportion of women getting positions was proportional, fully proportional to the percent of women entering the competition. In some areas like bio biomedicine, there are more women. In physics, there are less women. So for those of you working in the TESIC, again, sorry, it's in Spanish, if you want to know how is biology and biomedicine in our area, at the entry level, 30% women uh, in career investigators, 30% women professors, 24% women. So we are just one point below the average TESIC in biomedicine. And that is terri terrible because we were over 50% students a long time ago. 50% graduates a long time ago in all biology, pharmacy, medicine, so on. So it's just that you know things get very slow. Now, in the last uh, three minutes, I want to go very quickly to one example when a cluster or program gets things seriously concerning gender. And I am going to send Angela the link to this program because this was um, a, a meeting last uh, week in, here in Madrid by the uh, Human Brain Project, which is a flagship project of the H2020 um, uh, funding. They have taken seriously that you have to really have measures to promote gender equality. There are four slides. I'm only going to read the titles, because I don't have the time, and some of the things are really similar to those that uh, I mentioned to the cell roots. But it's just to show you the enormous amount of things one can do within a cluster, within a project, a big project to improve things, okay? You can have measures for uh, indicators of PhD for the education. So you can do workshops, career building workshops, resources lists, etc. In governance, you have measures recommended for cluster governance. 
guidelines and policy, general advisory committee, open calls, monitoring numeric processing and report at all levels. Monitoring in the annual report is something so basic and there are still centers, institutes, institutes at the FSI that do not present in the annual report the number of men and women in each rank, in each uh, uh, level of, of science. This is, I don't understand, it's just against the law, against rationality, against everything. Measures are recommended on leadership and governing bodies. Three things. So there are a number of things. For instance, follow and support dual career couples. Dual, dual career couples. I mentioned before that sometimes women follow more often men's uh, men in in their postdoc positions. And in this particular cluster, 94% of the female leaders, but only 39% of male leaders, live in a dual career family. That is. Women are more often married to men scientists when they are in the top positions in science. And that is something that you could do for your own cluster. <laughs> now, just this is the last slide. I'm going to show you to leave five minutes for questions. Uh, they just say, OK, we have to develop a gender action plan with targets, specific targets, like you do with all the work packages, and key performance indicators. And of course, we have to call to action. It's not only to write it, it's just to do it. So these are the uh, six interesting points that uh, have everyone in the cluster to keep in mind. Encourage diversity in your team, in the particular team that is applying or participating in the project. Consider women and men equally for promotion. Support colleagues with child care responsibilities. Seek female and male speakers for your events, very important. Invite female and male members for committees and check our partner institutions and regulations. So there is a lot of room for improvement. I hope that in your cluster, in your program, this talk helps you to at least think about it. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Flora, for this uh, very clear uh, view of the current situation in human sciences. I think we have a couple of minutes for questions. Are there any questions? Well, first of all, look at the numbers. When we convinced the president of the FSC in 2001 that something was wrong at the FSC, it was because we showed him the statistics for one particular institute in Madrid. It was the Institute of uh, Material Sciences, Institute of Materials in Madrid. At that time, if you look at the professors, investigators, and entry-level scientists, there were not three clusters of bars. There, were, w there was two bars in the entry level, two bars in the intermediate level, one bar in the full professor level. And he said, smiling, oh, you got the, right, uh, the, the slide wrong. No, no, we did not get the slide wrong. At that time, in the CMB, there was zero professors and 20 full professors. When I arrived in my institute in the CIB, that was 1991, I came from uh, the United States at that time, there was one woman and 23 full professors. A couple of months later I arrived, I went and knocked at her door and said, Consuelo, Consuelo de la Terra, do you realize you are the only woman full professor in this institute with 90 uh, staff scientists? And, oh, I didn't realize it. <laughs> so at least look at the numbers. I mean, if you, in, in your classes, in your institution, in your lab, well, in labs in biomedicine, at least in Spain, we are full of women. Now I'm trying to do the opposite, getting some men in our lab. <laughs> <laughs> because what you have to put in your brain is that diversity is important. All um, uh, companies know that. I mean, companies look for money, and they say that, I'll do anything if I can get my balance up. And they know that diversity is the key. It's better if you have work, uh, a worker from India and another of the United States than if you have two from the United States. Because the view is different. The skills are different. So at least, first of all, look at the numbers. And second, every time you, have, uh, you are in a committee, look around and be sure if you have a pile of 10 CVs, 
split them in male and female, and look at them in the best time of the day. Don't look at the men in the morning and the ladies in the evening, <laughs> because after you're tired, you're not gonna look at them equally. So what I do, if I had a committee, I split the two piles. In general, the male pile is higher, but occasionally it's the female pile, and I look alternatively. So I don't even remember the name at the end. I just have marks on the criteria. And then if you are facing a committee where you're the only woman, then have a good breakfast and vitamins, because you're gonna have to fight. <laughs> it's for sure that some of the men in the committee have not done as yourself, trying to be neutral in the looking at the series. I have been in committees that I cannot feel so embarrassed because somebody is really fixed. The, the thing is that sex, sexism and nepotism synergize. So if you go to a committee where the president of the committee knows already the result of the, of the um, uh, competition, something is wrong. And it may not have to do with sex or gender of the applicants. It may have to do, this person is the son or that, or may the PhD thesis with that. Clusters of nepotism are really, really very prevalent. So prepare yourself to fight, and fight until the end. <laughs> Initially, uh, we had 8% professors. So if you see that increase, then you say, oh, we are doing very well. That was from 1970s up to uh, the present. Now, if you look at the uh, to early 2000s, when we started to have the Commission for Women in Science, professors were 13%. So it's over 10%, uh, I mean, 10 points uh, improvement. But the thing is that almost all the improvement up to 23% was in the initial six years. So for the last four or five years, it's flat. And you know why it's improving now the ratio from last year to this one? Because there are more men that are uh, retired at the full uh, professor level, and since they are not entry level, new people, not men or women, it's just an, an artifact of statistics. So the last three years are very depressing. So thank you very much, okay. for I'm sorry, I have to run. <laughs> so I think